Welcome everyone, I'm Bob Norton, and this is a growth and scaling workshop, the first in a series of 12, and everyone is allowed to, to come to one for free, and there will be a uh, you know an offer at the end for access to all 12 of them. Basically, we're you know generating a course live on scaling, and I'm quite confident that this information has never been put in any training before because there are so few people that have actually scaled multiple companies to over a hundred million in sales. And it's all coming from my own experience now about 35 years as a CEO and serial entrepreneur. Everyone seeing my screen okay? And, and please do mute and use the chat. Uh, let's see here. Uh, just a quick thing about me. I, I hate when people do webinars and they spend 20 minutes bragging and talking about themselves. And, you know, I don't need to read this all to you, but, you, you know, you got to know it's coming from someone that is credible in the topic that we're talking about here, which is scaling today. So I've been a CEO and serial entrepreneur since 1989. Prior to that, for eight years, I was a technologist and one of the founders of Thomson Reuters it was called Thomson Financial Services and merged with Reuters. We actually bought Reuters, even though we were a much younger, smaller company. When we started that, we grew so fast that we acquired a much older competitor. I've been training and coaching CEOs since 2002. And in 2004, I started the CEO Bootcamp, which has graduated uh, thousands of CEOs from over 40 countries now. Most importantly, you know, I've grown companies, uh, several companies at 100% per year, had four exits over a billion dollars. And the, the total gross result of that was 25 times their money back to my investors. And, and well over 10 billions in, in sales. Even today, although I can't track all the individual products because they're part of larger companies now, that 14 years while I was a CEO, before I started advising, I generated uh, 17 million in equity value each year um, that I was a CEO. A CEO bootcamp I mentioned, airtight management, we'll talk a little bit about later. It is the world's first modular growth operating system designed for small companies. It's 18 times more comprehensive than the closest competitor. And it's very sophisticated and, and takes about a year to install with training, coaching, and consulting. I've taken two companies from raw startup to over 100 million in sales, 100 and 156 million to be exact. And the odds of doing that are actually 30 to 9 million to one of doing two of those because getting to 100 million in sales only happens to one in 6,300 companies, as we'll look at a, a little bit later. I was VP of engineering and chief technology officer and created the products, all the products, and ran the Skunk Works as well as founded First Call, one of the spin-off companies or divisions of, uh, of what's today Thomson Reuters. And First Call became a, a worldwide monopoly because of its powerful strategy, uh, as well as very advanced technology platform for the time. I've worked in many different industries, and almost everything I do is industry agnostic because it's at the people and strategy level. I've written six books, 200 articles, and now have 40 courses and six professional certifications for management and C-level people. And I also like to do yacht racing. I call myself a serial hobbyist. I'm a scuba diver, a yacht racer, have a lot of hobbies that I've done over the years. And I guess I can be accused of being a little competitive, but not to the point of bad manners. <laughs> so as I said, about one in 400 companies are one quarter of 1% will reach a mere $10 million in dollars in sales. And one in 6,300 companies will reach $100 million in sales. And almost everyone knows that about 80% or, or more of startups fail within five years. And in fact, even at, when you look at the ones that are venture backed and have five or a million more in revenue, you'll find that they still have an 80% uh, failure rate, sort of the dirty little secret in venture capital, is they're not very good at picking companies. 
you know, the ones that do real big are the bulk of their profits. The 80% will will fail. About 10% will become what they call the living dead, in which they can't get a good exit, but, you know, they're survivable, marginally profitable companies that probably can't grow very well. And then 10% will pay all the returns of these uh, venture capital companies. So statistically, it's 1,260 times harder to get a company to 100 million than it is for a startup. And so that's why I say that scaling is probably the most or one of the most uh, rare and difficult skills there is. And we're going to define scaling for you because growth and scaling, you know, don't have official definitions, but we we like to talk about no less than 25% compound annual growth rate uh, for for scaling and potentially 100% or more. So that gives investors around a 10x in their stock price and valuation of the company in in five years uh, and potentially 20x if you just wait a little longer. This program is really exclusively for companies that already have a product market fit. So they have at least a million in annual sales. And you're going to see why that's the case as we go through the top 40 things that need to be prepared before you start scaling. One of the the best best selling books of all time in business is Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. And I suspect most of you have read it. If you haven't, you should. It's got some great concepts, but one that's in it that is often forgotten is that Jim Collins studied about 200 companies. I forget the exact number. And you know, of course, he had his students do all the hard work and gather all the data. But at the end of the book, what he concluded is that it took an average of eight to 10 years for companies to figure out their systems to be ready to scale. And, and of course, that was a study of the biggest and most successful companies ever. And there's always exceptions to the rules. But statistically speaking, that's an average across hundreds of companies that, that got there looking at their startup phase, the systemization that they had to do. But what he would say and what I would say is you know, greatness is actually all about making a decision and the discipline. There are many factors that allow you to become, you know, what I would call a scalable company that can grow at 25% plus to, to 100% per year. But you can, if you have all those things, and we're going to talk about 40 of them today, I'm sure there are well over 100, and we'll, we'll discuss that in the whole series. But I believe you can grow as fast as you want just by making that choice and doing the things right, obviously with the right team, a big enough market, and, and many more attributes that, that are required. And it's literally true that any company can become a billion-dollar company because a company is just a legal entity that you put products and services into, right? And so if you add to the product portfolio mix and and go after creating new products constantly or adding niches and verticals and horizontal markets when you get big enough and you're not facing off against 100 pound or 800 pound gorillas, you know, pretty much any company can, can become a hundred million dollar company. So to me, this is the visual of, you know, what scaling is versus what growth is. And I'm going to show you the numerical impact of this and why it's so important. Because what happens is scaling becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because you attract capital and you attract the best team members because there's there's more wealth to be made for them individually in stock uh, and, and of course, for the investors as well. So I would say that, you know, sort of normal growth, you know, is five to 15%. But of course, if you're growing less than the rate of inflation, you know, at 10%, you're really not growing at all. So you've got to adjust for that in, in inflation, which is very high. And frankly, I, I know for a fact, it's been much higher than the government has advertised for a long time. You know, I would say that we're certainly in a recession here on, you know, when we're making this recording, which is in 2023, because we had an 8.7% cost of living adjustment from the government to Social Security. And we're bragging about 3% growth. Now, no matter what calculator you use, you know, 8.7, you know, compared to 3% growth is negative 5.7% growth. And of course, a recession is defined by two quarters of negative growth, but I don't think they're adjusting for recession. So we are in a recession now, 
And if you're not growing at 10%, you're probably staying the same, really. So we, we try to get our clients to 50% growth. Of course, it's going to vary by the client situation. And you're going to see a lot of the criteria that are necessary here today to have that kind of growth. But, you know, this, this visual is not overstating how much difference that makes because of the compounding of that growth over several years. So if you were an employee or an investor, it's pretty obvious which of these trains you want to hop on. And one is, is just going to be both more exciting. It's going to offer more advancement opportunity and learning for your career. And of course, the financial rewards can be much greater. So, so here's a quick slide just showing the difference of what happens at these different growth rates. And I've got, this is a, a spreadsheet I'd be happy to send to anyone. It's got a starting rate of 2 million here so that these numbers over here are starting with that 2 million base. These numbers are factors. And so what you see is with 10% growth, you know, you need eight years to get to doubling the business, whereas with 100% growth, obviously, you need one year, you know, to, to get to doubling the business, right? So in a five-year time horizon, which is often what venture capitalists and other say they want as, as an exit, you're talking about making the stock 32 times more valuable and the valuation of the company potentially going up 32 times. And that's if the price to earnings ratio of the company stays the same. And one of the things that we do is we have about 17 different techniques to increase that price to earnings ratio, barriers to entry or moats around the business. And, and so if you double that, you know, that 32 could become 64. And that's really what we try to do with our clients to drive up the sustainable competitive advantage, which is correlated to the barriers to entry to business. And that's what drives huge growth. And we'll look through many case studies of that and the averages across different industries and what price to earnings they get and why and how you can add those uh, criteria to your businesses. So this is a, a hugely important concept. I don't see it taught at all. I don't know if I'm the first one that came up with this. Doubt it. It must be out there before. But the idea here is that to be a rapid growth company, you have to have differentiation in the market because otherwise you're going to have to price like a commodity. If you're on the left side of this, you're a commodity business. And so you can't get margins enough to reinvest and fund your growth. And you're not going to have the interest of, of investors to attract capital. And of course, protectability is just the amount of time that you can sustain that differentiation or you know, the sustainable competitive advantage, the SCA, we call it. So many businesses are, are commodities and they don't have enough differentiation and protectability. And, and so I would say immediately and I would know immediately that that's not a scalable company. Now, some think that the only way to do that is to have intellectual property. And that's not true. You don't need patents. You know, everyone ought to use copyrights to some degree for reasons that we'll go into in another another seminar. And we have a course on sustainable competitive advantage and intellectual property as well. But what you really need to do is get at least to be very competitive in the market. And then you might be able to reach that 25%. And you'd have a shot of attracting better people to some degree and attracting venture capital. If you get here and you're distinct and you have a very protectable position with barriers to entry, then you're talking about the potential to go 50 to 100%. And of course, if you have a breakthrough company, something that's very disruptive, and protectable, then, then you're going to be able to uh, grow at 100% plus potentially. So this is where you want to be. And this is a decision. This isn't something that happens to you. This is your strategy. This is adding more barriers to entry to your strategy and building uh, that sustainable competitive advantage. So we have a program, our platinum program, where we guarantee to add $10 million dollars to a company's valuation with a one-year program, which is the first in the industry. But we could only do that if a company has products and services that are in this circle here. Now, I work with commodity companies and I work with companies here, and they've got to change their product mix to get over here in this top right quadrant if they want to have that level of scalability. I'm sure most of you have heard of uh, Simon Sinek and see, seen this video, Why? I mention it because it's one of the things that is very important. Why is what gets people excited? Why is what them 
makes them feel they're adding value to the world and they can go home and talk to their spouse and their friends about the contribution they're making. And, and of course, the younger generation says a lot about that. We'll see how much they really do it over the next decade. But they say they want to you know, have that social impact. Et cetera, et cetera. But no one wants to work overtime to make you rich as an owner or, or a CEO founder if they, they don't have that sort of emotional tie-in and feeling that they're going to make an impact. Typically, venture capitalists require a billion-dollar market five years out. It could be a lot smaller. And I usually recommend that startups don't go after a market that's over $100 million in their market entry strategy but then you're going to expand that over time. But because growth eats cash in almost any business, unless you have 95% margins, you know, and, and a, a, sh a short sales cycle, you know, you're going to have to raise some capital to scale at the rates we're talking about of 50 to 100%. So if you need to raise capital, you've got to meet the criteria that is going to give them that 10x uh, exit. Uh, basically, and I, I mentioned this already, VCs aren't that great at picking companies because they're not CEOs that have run businesses or serial entrepreneurs. They can't model a business in their mind instantly with neuroplasticity, as I can from 30 years of practicing and doing strategy and operations, as well as sales, marketing, finance, product development, and everything else that's necessary in leadership and management. And I already mentioned, since they make most of their money on that 10%, you're not really going to have a chance of attracting big capital unless they can see you reaching that $1 billion market. But any company uh, can reach a billion in sales. I haven't numbered these because I, I was moving them around with the order and I didn't want to have to redo them all the time. But this is probably number four or five in the list of 40 that we're going to cover today. Although one is going to be 20 on one slide and a matrix that's easy to remember for you. Um, I have an article on vision, and I believe I have a video on YouTube on vision. And the press tends to print or talk about a very limited uh, version of vision. Typically, you know, it's a product and I'm going to be $100 million and it's this product and that market. But a vision is more complex than that. And these little arrows that are in these concentric circles are meant to represent the uh, interacting effects between this. You know, if you change your product and your price point, it's going to have effect on, on your sales process and your margins and therefore your finance and possibly your marketing because your customer acquisition cost will change, right? So anytime you change one of these slices of this vision pie, it's going to have an impact. And, you know, here the inner circle is the strategy, you know, which might be 10% of the business and the work, the center is the core idea. That's your, you know, hopefully that's whatever you're building that no one else can do, what Jim Collins calls the hedgehog concept. What are you going to be the best in the world at? If you invest in that, there are probably dozens of ways to monetize that in the future with pivots or slightly different business models, or by going into different geographies, different markets, or making small changes to your product. So you can invest in this core if it's proven valid without worrying about getting your money back. And, and it's sad when so many companies spend a fortune, but they don't understand you know, what their core is and stick to it because they chase the short term of you know, what one customer says or whatever. Um, the outer circle is, of course, the tactical part of the business, and that's probably near 80% of the business. So you've got to have a vision. This is a tool to sell both to employees and, of course, you know, founders and senior managers and team people that are going to understand the business and want to understand where you're going. It's different than the why. The why is the emotional reason that they want to make your product and your company successful because it's going to have some benefit in the world. The vision is these 11 components, and most people don't think through those 11 components and most people don't have experience in all these things. So you really need a team to do that as well. A good quote is, you know, you've got to have a strategic plan. And Warren Buffett says an idiot with a plan can beat a genius without a plan. And that is not, you know, counter to the idea 
that, you know, as soon as you hit the market, you're going to have changes because the plan and the work you've done still has tremendous value. So you've got to have a strategic plan and that's sort of the how you're going to do it. And, and of course, it's conceptual. So you may not be able to prove the uh, the ec exact economics of it. You're trying to reduce that risk as you do more in the marketplace. But it is proof that you're doing your homework and have done your market research, your competitive intelligence, your thought about how you're going to put barriers to entry around the business, et cetera. The next thing you need is the ability to shift gears. And by that, I mean, move away from what made you successful before, because you've all heard the, the, the phrase, what gets you here won't get you there. OK, it is a requirement that all CEOs and even all the management and, and, and C-level team shift gears. And that means philosophically in terms of risk management, systemization, management style, all kinds of things that have to change. And what this shows is, is what the focus and the need for both the CEO and sometimes the whole management team is at each of these stages. So early on, you know, often when you're in stealth mode, if it's a technology company, you're focused on the product development and make sure you have a, a the best market you can have that's willing to pay the most for the product, right? But you very quickly have to switch once you've proven you've done your beta or your launch and you've gotten feedback and made any adjustments that are needed or maybe a slight pivot. You've got to go to the early revenue stage, which means you've got to now focus on selling. And that means sales process and all those other things. Once you reach established, that's when they bring in the, quote, professional managers and over half of founders will be replaced by, you know, their investors because they don't know how to do that gear shift. Um, the shift between two and three is probably the hardest because you're beginning to have to systematize everything. And we're going to get to, in this session today, all the things that have to be systematized for a business to be scalable. And of course, in growth expansion, I mean, that tends to be the fun part. As long as you've laid the right, right foundation, you can't build a skyscraper on a weak foundation. And so you've got to have the business model design, the market, and all of these other things we're going to talk about today be solid before you start growing at more than 20 or 25 percent per year. This is just one example, and I have many of these kind of conceptual diagrams that are visual, but it, it is actually, uh, you know, it's looked down on to be like a dictatorial manager or a micromanager, right? But it's actually important in stage one of a company in a startup where the CEO and founder has their hands and fingers on everything and they're, they're managing a small team. And so it's actually appropriate to be dictatorial here. But one of the most common failures of CEOs and whole founding teams is not moving up this as you go through the stages. Once you reach seven or so people, somewhere between seven and 12, of course, your mileage may vary. There'll be a little variation here depending on the industry, but you've got to adjust the management to, to be more collaborative and more team oriented and of course, more systematized. And you've got to be a fully collaborative management team to be in that rapid growth and expansion stage because you can build a tiny house alone, but you can't build a skyscraper alone. And when you get that, that rapid growth, what you're going to find is you also get a vacuum because as you grow, the management team is diluted rapidly. And if you haven't filled in the foundation and all the systemization of the business, you'll have all kinds of problems. And so there's many companies that go up and down and up and down, sometimes for years or even a decade because they can't break through that change to be more systematized in the business uh, and to work on the business. You've got to have product market fit. Typically, we, we only like to work with an airtight management, the uh, $1 million plus companies, because they've got at least a proven element of having proven their product. And, and hopefully they're out of that 80% failure rate to some degree but they're actually starting a sharper climb of the mountain here with that 1260x more difficulty, you know, to get to $100 million and, and 400 times more difficulty just to get to $10 million, right? You, you must have identified a narrow market. Now, this is counterintuitive. 
And I think some people don't know that. Everyone wants to say, oh, our product is needed by everybody. No one, no one, no one ever started a massive company without starting in a niche, okay? You cannot name one company. I challenge you to think of one. And you'll think you are, but you haven't researched the early days of that company. You know, Airbnb started as a convention thing. I think it was in San Francisco, what city? Salesforce.com started selling airports just to traveling salespeople because they're the ones that needed the cloud capability the most. Facebook started in colleges, right? If you look at almost every scalable big company success, they started with a niche and then they expanded. Elon Musk does this with every company and every product he launched. He launched the the Roadster was the first car, $100,000 plus high performance vehicle, very tiny niche market with no competition, right? But then his next car was more affordable, the, the Model S and then the Model D and the Model Y, right? And so he was expanding with a portfolio of products. But of course, the early investment in R&D was now able to be used in those in those other products almost at no cost because it's all intellectual property, right? You must have a repeatable customer acquisition process, right? And, and that means to understand your, your customer acquisition cost and have a scalable lead gen. A lot of people have made the mistake of thinking, you know, they can run PPC on Facebook and, you know, what happens is they hit a wall when they hit 1 million or 10 million or 5 million and, and suddenly they can't go anywhere. So you've got to know that the, the market is big enough or you've got to have this portfolio of products or portfolio of markets with one product that might vary a little for each of those niches. Next on the list of 40, executive team in place, and, and they must be committed long-term. Young people greatly underestimate this. And uh, it's another reason I don't like to work with startups anymore with people under 30, because they have this Pollyanna belief because they read in a headline somewhere, you know, what Elon Musk did and they think they can do it. I had someone call me last year who was just out of school, no money, no experience. And the first thing out of his mouth was, can you coach me to be a billionaire by next year? So after I got done explaining to him that that's never happened in the history of the world, and arguably the best entrepreneur in the last hundred years, Elon Musk took 12 years to reach a billion dollars. I said I didn't want to work with him because he was just too optimistic. And our, unfortunately, our school system is teaching that because they're overcorrecting for self-esteem today. So many people uh, have ridiculous beliefs and expectations about what they can achieve. I believe the everyone gets a trophy is one of the worst ideas in history. And it's literally ruining our society now because the young people aren't I'm prepared for the real world. You've got to have, uh, you know, typically, the most common is those three people, you know, are the CEO, the marketing expert, and the product expertise, right? You've got to have one of the best products that's differentiated and, and hopefully, uh, you know, a game changer and a disruptive product, right? So these are the three highest risk people and highest risk areas. And if you don't have people with 15 plus ex years experience doing this, I can't provide you any data because I don't think it's out there or it's tracked by anyone, but I would bet 10 to 1 that that company's odds of being successful are much less. So you've got to get the right people on the bus, and that means serious experience. I have had founders come to me, and they want to hire their buddy from college who has no experience in Python programming to build a state-of-the-art business that needs Python, and, and that's a guaranteed formula for disaster. You know, it's got zero chance of success, really, unless you're so lucky at one in a million. And, and one in a million isn't a strategy. Next on the, the 40 list of things you need is a proven lead generation system, okay? You've got to understand your cost of generating a lead, and you've got to have you know a very high cap on that, at least to get you stable and profitable. Or you've got to 
quickly offer that product in another niche to amortize your, you know, your product development and your R&D and other fixed costs over a larger customer base. Ideally, you should start with a multiple market niche strategy. This is how I know as an angel investor and when I'm evaluating business plans for, you know, Ideasphere and MIT and, you know, a gathering of angels and all these other groups that, that I am an, an angel investor in and sometimes coach the companies. You know, if they're presenting that vision of how they're going to enter multiple markets, we'll talk about that a lot in, in one of the, the 12 sessions, then you know they're more sophisticated and they're going to do a better job of, uh, of succeeding. As I mentioned earlier, Google and Facebook PPC probably has a cap to it. And so you've got to think beyond that. And you certainly don't want to be in the huge markets of verticals and horizontal markets on day one. You want to be in a, in a niche, which is the intersection of an application and a vertical market, right? So that's a smaller target where you can customize and not be going head to head with IBM or Google or Apple or, or someone else. Then you become stable and time is on your side once you reach some level of profitability and you'll be able to raise capital and, and go grow into other markets. You've got to have a proven sales process, right? Here's a, a funnel and everyone knows the concept of a funnel, but I created this diagram in 2004 for the first CEO bootcamp. And this looks at what are the conversion rates and what holes are in the funnel, okay? That's a true understanding of what your funnel is. And this will be different for every company. What's your customer acquisition cost or your lead acquisition cost more, more accurately? Because your customer acquisition, when they become a customer, is after they've gotten through all this. And obviously, that's going to be much higher because of the fallout rate as they go further and further down the funnel. You've got to have that formula down. In fact, that formula is probably the number one thing that sophisticated investors will want to know right away. Have you figured out if I spend X dollars on customer acquisition or marketing, you know, and Y dollars working that funnel of people with sales efforts, whatever that is, that might be e-commerce and happen automatically in some businesses, but in most, it's going to need a little push, especially if you have higher price points. General thinking is you can't sell anything more than $1,000 online, unless they've heard of it before and they know the brand or they're getting a guarantee from Amazon. You know, Obviously, there are exceptions to that because they're established products and businesses. But if you're a new business and a startup, people are weary of, uh, of buying anything over $1,000. And sometimes this is called the virtuous circle, right? If you put these three things in a circle, the gross margin or the gross net profit is starting to feed the next set of a next round of marketing. And if that's profitable, you know, you're now feeding more money into marketing and that starts an upward spiral. So that's the virtuous circle of finance around a, a new product and a new business. I always insist, and I think it's very important, and most people don't understand it. Frankly, most CFOs don't understand it. You've got to build a simulator, not a pro forma, okay? There are a lot of unknowns, and it is a given that you're going to need to make 50 or 100 adjustments in the first year to those financials. And so I believe that the CEO has to be able to sit down at lunch, plug in the driver numbers of that business, and model everything. And I've got very sophisticated models I do this with. I'm calculating the stock price five years out by changing the sales conversion rate and the price of the product and, and various other drivers in the model. And, and the most financial people, they, they're they gonna straight line, extrapolate a business very well, but they're not gonna be able to do what we call strategic budgeting or innovation budgeting, because it's basically a wild ass guess, a wag, right? You're, you're one, you can't give them the real numbers yet in an early stage company or even a new product because you don't know for sure any of these things. So I, I like to say that if you're working on the three and four and five year things, you're trying to get exactly wrong. And, and so you, you even though you need a five year financial, 
you know, most of those things are going to change rapidly in years one and two. And so you need this flexible simulator that's driven by the variables that drive the business. And, and, and so I said, it's, it's a rare CFO that kind of knows how to do that because that's R&D, that's innovation, that's taking a lot of guesses. Uh, and that's not what financial people are paid to do or schooled to do. So this, this becomes a what if tool. And it's going to help you make a lot of decisions. So I, I believe, and I, I doubt many people say this, but I believe this is a necessary component. Some people might throw a lot of finance people at it to figure it out. But I think the interactivity of that is the difference between planning a, a you know, a trip with a, a map, you know, and a pen and paper and a GPS, right? That GPS has enormous advantages because you can adjust on the fly. So I'm sure the metaphor breaks down at, at some place like everything does, but I think it's a dramatic difference. You've got to have a board of directors or a board of advisors. You know, in the early stages of a startup, you know, under a few million in sales, I, I use those two terms entertain, interchangeably because, you know, one is obviously a legal duty and, you know, a, a board of director member that has some liability in being part of that business, whereas a board of advisors would not have that legal liability. But many of the things they do are going to be the same, and, and a board of advisors may morph into a board of directors. You need the wisdom experience of, of a, that team to have lunch with and to ask questions rapidly. You've got to have people that care, and they should go across that whole vision pie some of them should have sales and marketing because those are risky areas. Some of them should, you know, be a counterweight to your R and D head if you're doing product development. And, and obviously, they should count, uh, or counteract, or, or complement your own experience as a CEO. Most people are paying between this range. You know, a startup, of course, it varies based on stage, right? But somewhere between 0.25 percent and one percent equity, you know, per year vested over a three-year term. Maybe you have a two-year term or a three-year term on your board. And I know that's a, a large range, but that's because the range of people you're trying to attract is different. And of course, the size of the opportunity makes a difference too in your ability to sell that vision. So that's why the range has to be uh, pretty large. You've got to have, but you've got to have those three to five key members. They're not only increasing your network, but they're helping you hire people where they have expertise because you can't hire, you know, the best program in the world if you're not pretty damn good programming yourself. You can't hire the best salesperson. You can't hire the best CEO unless you have that skill yourself. So you want to have those people on a hiring team. And those are ma mainly, you know, uh, gray haired people or in my case, you know, pretty bald on top. Right. Because they've got a lot of mileage on their chassis. And, you know, they've they've learned all those lessons the hard way. So you've got to look at the CEO team and, and uh, complement that C-level team with your board of directors. We'll talk a little bit more about that later in the, the matrix of the things you have to learn. You've got to control your culture and make sure you're hiring top people. Take a note, if you, if you will, and go to YouTube and search on Bob Norton Airtight Management Southwest. This talks about how Southwest uses its brand as a hiring filter. And we don't have the time for it today because we're 48 minutes in and we got a little late start, but you can see that that video. You've got to have a foundation and, and that's the team we already talked about. I call the ideal culture a Darwinian meritocracy. And if you think about that, you'll realize both of those words carry a lot of meaning and, and maybe some charge. Darwinian, because you've got to shed your skin and, and grow and adapt, right? Darwin said, it's the most adaptable that survive. He did not say, as some people think, it's the strongest that survive or it's the fastest that survive. Long term, it's the most adaptable that survive. And a meritocracy is a culture where everyone's honest they're on the team, they have high trust, they communicate well, they use great goal setting and communications techniques, uh, and, and so they act as a team well. The Southwest thing I already mentioned, go see that video. You'll be surprised and you'll probably smile uh, when, you, when you understand how and why Southwest Airlines selects people. And at one point, they were worth more than all the other airlines combined when Herb Keller was running that business after deregulation. You've got to eliminate slackers, narcissists. We actually have a, a, a course on how to identify 
sociopaths and uh, psychopaths. Uh, everyone should realize that one in 20 people is either a sociopath or a psychopath. That's a statistical fact. 4% of people are sociopaths. They do not care about anyone else. They're very manipulative. They can bring a company down by doing sneaky things and ruining your culture. And so it's best if you know how to avoid those and how to get rid of them, or of course, even better, not hire them in the first place. We call our system six, an airtight management, human capital acquisition and development, or HCAD for short. And that is sort of the collection of best practices around hiring and controlling your culture. Culture doesn't happen to you. You need to control and determine what your culture is going to be, what's going to match your market. I meant to grab the, the title for top grading the book. This one is top grading for sales, which was a subsequent book. But what I'm referencing here that, that everyone should probably read is Top Grading by Brett Brad Smart. This is, I guess, a spinoff of it for sales. And it's it's got a lot of the philosophies that uh, that we teach and use on how to hire well. Obviously, if you're hiring and you have rapid turnover in a high growth company, it's going to be a struggle. That brain drain and the cost of that turnover, which has been estimated at six figures of losing a manager, you know, is huge. It's huge in brand risk. It's huge in economic loss. It's a huge loss in morale. So you've really got to hire well and keep people for the long term. And that means paying the best people the best salary, base salary you can afford. And of course, on top of that, some equity or bonus participation. It can, if you're going to have that growth, you want to handcuff, you know, the golden handcuffs, they call it, right? You want to handcuff those people to the business longer term and have a lot of their compensation come from the long-term success of the equity in the business. You know, the biggest danger in growing a company is when you hit new territory. You know, I, I like to say that, you know, no one would ever try to climb Mount Everest after reading a book alone, right? No one would ever, you know, get in a plane, you know, after reading a book, on, you know, because we know and we understand that knowing the facts is different than experience. But somehow, us highly egotistical CEOs who have to be egotistical and brave and self-confident forget the fact that we never took a company to 10 million before, or we never took a company to 100 million before, and they don't get someone on the team, whether it's a board of directors, and you know that might not be enough, you know, or a mentor or a coach, or you know, hopefully someone even in the C-level suite that has been in high growth, rapid growth situations before. So don't let your ego as, as a CEO let you believe you know these things. Because I guarantee you, I could list a thousand things I learned growing companies. And, you know, we're going to talk about a lot of them in this series, of course. Airtight, so those of you who are familiar with you, most of you are here because you, you got an email from my list. We didn't do a lot of outside marketing for this because I'm fully booked at the moment. And, I, you know, I expected to market this event a lot more, but, you know, I'm working 60 hour weeks already, so I just haven't had time to do it. But the this is the six systems of airtight management. And so this counts as six of the things you need. And this is our model. Granted, there's other ways to skin the cat. But what we do is drop in IP on the strategic planning process, which you can argue is the most complex process by far in the business, because it involves sales, marketing, finance, product development, operations, management, legal issues, governance, et cetera, et cetera. You've got to have all of those integrated into your, your strategy, right? Management best practices, we teach five styles of management in this, and all of this is synthesized from hundreds of books. I've read over a thousand books in my career. I you know, probably could have been just 200, but you couldn't tell which 200, right? So I do have a list of recommended books I'm happy to share with you as well. The dashboards and metrics, this is running the business by the numbers and getting to the point where you can manage by exception and everything else is a standard operating procedure, right? You've got to measure, as Peter Drucker, the father of management, says you cannot improve what you don't measure. And of course, that's literally true, right? Uh, how would you know you improved it if you didn't have a metric, right? Strategic budgeting, we talked about this briefly in innovation and disruption. 
it's very difficult to project and predict revenue and profit and those other things. You're taking a wild ass guess, right? And you've got to be ready to change that and, and pivot and change your model. Process management and optimization, having a system for that, that is right sized to your company stage of development. This is not Six Sigma. In trying to implement Six Sigma in a rapid growth startup would be a mistake unless it was, you know, manufacturing company with a huge amount of capital and factories and stuff like that. So our process management system is simple and right sized for smaller companies. And then we've talked also about you know, controlling your culture, but this is the bigger set. This is all the IP we have training and, you know, having a learning and development program and all of the philosophies of management. So those are six more things that you know, I believe you need to scale. Some people might name them or talk about them differently. But to me, this is the management operations infrastructure that is needed to scale well. These six management systems are just necessary and no one gets there without them. This is, I think this is the main reason most companies don't ever get $10 million because somewhere between one and four or five million, they stall because they have not systematized these things and they don't know how to shift gears.